so first of all, you know, thank you very much for signing up. And I, I know it's a little bit late in some time zones, but we thought this will give you a chance for you to finish up your work during the day and participate and, you know, learn you know, something in the evening. So, you know, hope this uh, time zone works for you. Um, I wanted to go ahead and review the agenda here. Well, first of all, my name is Carlton Ihara. I run Business Development EcoSense. Uh, and today's agenda is uh, you know, basically based on this uh, data-driven uh, mitigation that I was talking to Jesse you know, a couple of months ago. Uh, by the way, he, he does a lot of video on YouTube uh, that's very educational. And as I was watching some of those video, uh, you know, there was one particular video where he was, of course, using one of our eco tracker, which I'll talk talk about later. Uh, but you know, he he was very very data driven, as uh, as I can see from his video. Uh, so we started talking. You know, is there something that perhaps you can, you know, teach the audience, the mitigation audience, uh, the professionals on you know some of the concepts you use in, in a data driven concept. So that's why we came up with this agenda, you know, so what is a data-driven concept? Um, you know, what, what does it use the data for? And, you know, how, how to use that data in, in making some of the uh, decisions that uh, he makes, you know, daily in his mitigation work. Uh, then I I'm gonna wrap up with a little talk on the product, the EcoTracker and others. Uh, so, you know, please meet Jesse, a little background on him. Uh, 2014, eight years in mitigation in the Minneapolis area. Uh, what was amazing is that he said that he got into uh, helping his father uh, when he was three years old. And uh, I was thinking about that. Well, I, I, I couldn't even ride a bike when I was three years old. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, so, so the point here is that Jesse has been in this uh, kind of home service uh, area. So he did a lot of concrete work. Uh, uh, lawn service uh, business. Uh, so he's been in that, you know, home service industry for his entire life, right? And one, one of the things that uh, he prides on is that he offers perhaps not the, uh, the lowest cost solution, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, on that one, but, you know, the best no. solution in terms of the mitigation system. So, you know, he targets a 1.5 or less than 1.5 in, in any house, in any situation, so um, you know, we, we'd, like, we'd like to hear from him. And I'm gonna go through this first session with Jesse on a kind of like an interview format. Uh, so I'll be asking the questions and then Jesse will be responding to those questions, okay? So with that, I guess, Jesse, we can go to the, you know, this data-driven concept. Uh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm gonna take this off the screen so that we could focus on the... Uh, the video. Okay, so Jesse, so we talked about this data-driven concept, right? So the first question I have is, uh, uh, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean by data-driven approach to mitigation? You know, what, what are some of your share of the philosophy? You know, what this means uh, in the mitigation area. Um, so I guess I would start Carlton by, mm -hmm. you know, I learned so much because people would sh were willing to share with me. So like, uh, I want to start with like a thanks to like the Josh Kerbers, the mm. Bill Broadheads, the uh, okay. Bruce Needs, Bill Angels, Jack Bartholomew, Chad Robinson was huge. But those guys are super radon nerds and they, I'm a radon nerd and <laughs> they just kind of got me down that rabbit hole of, you know, how can we do better? How can we do better? How can we do better? How can we optimize this? And, uh, just the data that you need um, to to make those decis decisions to make to optimize to make it better to get the rate on as low as possible to make it more energy efficient you need that data to be able to do that so when I talk about data you know I'm talking about you know rate on levels which eco tracker is nice because it gives us the fast response and um, pressure field extension, you know, where before it was just pressure field extension we were measuring. Mm. Um, but now we've got, you know, as the technology continues to progress, we've got more tools yeah, basically correct. at our disposal. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, those instant yeah. reading monitors are very useful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then just uh, 
I would encourage you if you're if you're wanting to get into this or understand pressure field extension a little bit more. Um, I I spent so much time wasted a lot of time, but it was good. You know, it was a good waste of time because I learned so much about pressure field extension. You know, I'd put testles all over. You know, fifteen testles in a house, and you know, I could see the correlation of where I started to lose pressure field extension. And yes, it slowed me down a lot in the beginning, um, but I learned so much from that. Now I can kind of see, you know, walk into a house and okay, I need testles there, there, and there, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. 13 other ones. Um, right. So you have to kind of slow down to be able to speed up in the future. And it, it was a lot of years of that slow down and just kind of process everything. I'm very slow to process information. But yeah, you mentioned something interesting, right? That you hate guesswork when it comes yeah. to mitigation jobs. I do hate guessing. Yeah, yes. Right, right. So yeah. the data, by having good data and analyzing the data, uh, you eliminate that guesswork, right? Yeah, we try to. Yeah. You know, the thing about radon mitigation is so much of what we're dealing with is below the slab and we can't see it. Um, so it's, it's not easy in a lot of cases. Um, so yeah, the more tools and data we have, the the better we can do, I feel like, yeah. which is better for the customer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is the first thing that you do in a mitigation job? Uh, aside from like hauling our tools in and setting up drop class and stuff, um, usually I kind of give John, John works with me. Uh, he's kind of my right hand man, gets everything set up for me, um, supplies me with tools and stuff. But I kind of give John a, a rundown. Um, when I go bid a job, I'm usually there for an hour and a half. So I got a pretty good idea of what our plan is going to be. So I'll kind of let John know, hey, we're going to go out to the garage here. I'm thinking probably suction point over here. we got to seal the sump. Tell him what options a customer wants. You know, maybe it's a water alarm or something. Um, and then I'll kind of tell John, you know, hey, we might do a suction point over there if diagnostics obviously suggest the need for it. Um, so given John just kind of an update, so we're both on the same page. And then John is usually setting up eco trackers. Uh, throughout the house in different areas. So we can start getting readings or kind of our baseline readings. And then uh, uh, we're figuring out where we want our test holes. And John's usually on top of doing that while I kind of continue to get set up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, PFE, our baseline numbers and our eco tracker. So we can start seeing those hotspots. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, are, are those steps different, uh, whether you are there on that first call, right? The first call that, hey, you know, I think I may need mitigation system or I'm not too sure versus a job where a system was already installed. You know, it could be your system or something installed by another mitigator. Yeah, so mostly we're, I, th I think by first call, you mean like I bid the job and I've showed up to do the install. Yeah, um, correct. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that we, uh, four, I got distracted. Charlie, the answer is four. Um, the kid comes with four. Uh, what was the question? Squirrel. I'm sorry. Uh, what? <laughs> I got distracted by Charlie's oh, oh, question. Oh, oh. No, no, I said that, you know, this is your first call versus uh, some oh, some, uh, call so, where you, you installed the system already or someone yeah, else installed the system. It's, it's not really a whole lot different. Um, when I'm bidding either of those, I'm in person. So it's kind of trouble doing some troubleshooting. If it's a system we didn't install, we had one a couple months ago where somebody installed it. It became winter or as it got slower, the radon level started to rise and the customer wanted it to be lower. So we start with, you know, going to check it out. And yeah, here's kind of what I think, but we'll get here and do diagnostics. So mm -hmm. the answer is no, it doesn't really change anything. Just our baseline numbers might change where with, if I'm installing the system for the first time, it's baseline numbers our PFE, you know, without applying suction anywhere. Hey, here's our starting point. Where with some, say, say somebody else put in the initial system, we've got just a different baseline of, hey, that RP145 on this current setup is giving us, you know, this for pressure field extension. And I can see, you know, hey, I've got negative PFE here and we're positive over there. Um, so I kind of know where I've got to go from there. 
Okay, okay. Uh, another question, uh, do you have to treat all the ground contact floors, crawl space uh, of a home? No, so no. we don't. I hate doing crawl spaces. <laughs> um, you should do it for indoor air quality. Um, but you don't always have to do it for radon mitigation. Um, we've got a video I just shot of my cousin's house. Uh, his name is Mike. And I filmed like three days of video. So it probably won't be out for a few months because it's going to take Danny a long time to edit. Mm, edit that, um, right. But it's a four level split. It's an old farmhouse built in like 57. Um, it's got a well room under the front step and then the basement. And then the kitchen is like slab on grade. And then you step down a few more steps and there's another slab on grade, which is like an old entryway or something. It might be the original foundation. So four different ground contact areas. Um, and we set up eco trackers everywhere. And within a few minutes, you know, an hour or something, we had you know, the readings, yeah, fairly consistent readings. Um, and that well room was hot. The well room was 15 and we treated the well room and fixed the house. We didn't have to treat the other areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. And, uh, this may be a little bit of a basic question, but, uh, so why do you measure the pressure field extension? Uh, so that we can engineer a system that creates suction. Um, I used to say, and I still do in our videos, so typically the key to getting your levels low is to engineer a system that creates suction under the entire house. But like in Mike's house, that wasn't the case. We, we treated the well room, which also got us pressure field extension in the basement. We didn't have to treat those upper floors. Um, and it's kind of the same we find with some crawl spaces. You know, we're, maybe you only have to treat half of them. Yeah. So there's, again, the, the data part. Uh, so how do you interpret the pressure field extension data, right? Yeah. You want to make those positive numbers negative. Yeah, of course. <laughs> to, to quote Josh Kerber from the Minnesota Department of Health, which <laughs> is who I call when I get stumped on something and he helps me tell it down to get back to basics. It, Hey, you just got to make those positive numbers negative, and it helps me kind of zoom out and look at it maybe in a different light. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why well, you got to measure those and find out where the positive numbers are first of yeah, all. Yeah, and then so, figure out how to get them negative. Uh, how to get them negative, right? Yeah, right. whether it's a suction point or right. stitching or something now. Yeah. Right. And again, this data that's yeah. very important. Um, now I'm going to change the subject a little bit. So how, how do you select the appropriate radon fan? Um, there's kind of three, three things that we need. Um, so I use that, that pedo tube from Kansas state and that tells, that allows me to measure the CFM. So I can measure how much air do I need to move with my static pressure. I can measure measure how hard do I need to suck to move that amount of air to achieve the pressure field extension that I'm looking for. So I kind of need those three data points. And then with the static pressure and the CFM, I can go to, to one of Bill Broadhead's fan curve charts, just happen to have one right here. So here's one for fan tech off of Bill Broadhead's site. Mm. And I can plot my point on here, you know, say I need 20 CFM at four inches of suction or four inch, I need to apply four inches of suction to achieve that 20 CFM. You can see it falls right here below the, the fan curve of the Fantech RN4 EC. So I know before I run any pipe, they were gonna use RN4 on this. So I can select that fan. And if you could see from that example, I still had a little headroom. I can then dial that fan in um, and or dial it down because it's going to be a little bit overkill for that situation. Mm -hmm. So the EC fans give me the control to be able to dial it down to get my target pressure field extension number. So that's kind of the simplest way I know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what are what are some of your practices after you find the you know the the appropriate fan? You do the uh, all the measurements again. You got that pressure field extension of the negative area. So what do you do after the mitigation system installed? What are some of your practices? 
Um, so after we're done, mm -hmm. like putting in for, a system for post mitigation testing, yeah. you're asking. Yeah. yeah. So I hate testing. I hate doing radon testing. It's a lot of office work and driving around. Um, I just like nerding out on mitigation. So we leave them air check test kits. Um, we give them an option to have a you know a third party person come in and test. Um, but I don't really do any post mitigation testing anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to, but I don't like doing it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I know you're you just got into some of the training programs, right? That you're running the training programs, right? I uh, I do train for Kansas State sometimes, and then we're okay. In a month, we're doing our own course for the first time. Yeah. See how okay. That goes. Yeah. yeah. So, but you, what you focus on is not so much like webinar kind of a session, but you know, actual hands-on training yeah. where you actually go out to a site, a potential uh, house, I guess, that needs yep. the mit mitigation done, I guess, and then you go in there with your students per se, yep. and actually go through the steps, right? Uh, yep. One, two, yeah, step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And some of the things that you were talking about just now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so it's basically what you see in some of our videos, um, especially some of the ones that we've paid to have done, you know, that's two days on the job. Or if it's that stitching video, we did all the stitching holes. You know, I was there for six days. Mm -hmm. All that footage gets edited down to it you know, 20 minute video or less. So it's all the spaces in between that you will be able to see in the course. So, you know, it's different to explain pressure field extension in a hotel classroom yeah. on a floor right. tile set up right. versus in the real world. You can see, hey, when I apply suction here, I'm not reaching over there or I am, or hey, this floating is blocking it. What happens if we seal this crack? You Like you could see it in real time and then I think the light bulbs will go off a lot easier for people. So you know, that's the idea behind it anyways. Okay. Yeah. Now, that is about the questions that I had. Uh, now, in the meantime, I've been watching the chat and the Q&A boxes, and there are a couple of questions. Um, maybe we'll address them now before I transition to the next section. Uh, okay. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to address all of them. There's quite a few. Uh, so let me see if I could just uh, pipe in. How I many see a couple from Nate. Yeah, under Q&A or actually, yeah. Yeah, people in are the chat, in I the guess. Chat. It'd be better in the Q&A. But on the chat, there was one question from Charlie, about how many eco trackers are you running on a job to start? Four. That's where I got sidetracked. Oh, that was a question. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Four. And four. You said four. They come. They come in this case. Yeah. So yeah. It's four, a, four pack. You get four of them. Uh huh. Yep. And it says, uh, "What indications alert you or the homeowner that they may need testing from uh, Patrick King?" What indications alert you or the homeowner that they may need testing? Well, they're reaching out to us. They know they have a radon problem. Or they're reaching out for testing, and then we sub all our testing out. Mm -hmm. Okay. From well, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I don't really go to a house just to check it out when they haven't done any radon testing. Yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is a question from... Nate, is there a charge for your site visit to gather info and design the system? Do you ever gather info over the phone for mitigation and do initial diagnostics upon arrival for design? Um, so I think, Nate, to answer your question, um, we do, Danielle is my receptionist, and we try to do a good job of qualifying people just because we charge so much more than our competitors. And it's it's like an hour and a half that I spend on every bid. So I don't want to go out and bid the jobs that were they're expecting $1,500 where I'm going to be way more than that. So no, we don't go out to every house. Um, and we don't charge for an estimate, but 
we only go out to like qualified places. Like we don't do stuff for sellers. Maybe we do one year, one house a year for a seller. And it's, you know, maybe that person that we have that already have that relationship with. Um, do we ever gather info over the phone? Yeah, so Danielle gathers, you know, their testing info and any pertinent info, you know, any comments they left, you know, you know what's important to them, which are website, contact us for them, for free estimate requests, um, request or ask for. So she'll put that info in there. So I'm not going in there blind. Usually I look at the house on Zillow before I get there. So just so I can kind of see what I'm getting into. And I mean, you know, I might see an addition off the back of the house on like Google satellite or something like that. So I'll know to look for that. Um, so yeah, we don't, like I said, we don't charge for that, but I spent an hour and a half there. I might do five bids a day when we're busy. Yeah, maybe this will be the last question. I'll, I'm gonna I'll take up from Dr. Leo Mormon. What guarantees the radon entry points do not change after half a year? That's a good question. <laughs> I'll put it back on you. <laughs> uh, we have, you know, a lot of our customers have radon monitors. Um, and then for the ones that don't, we offer like uh, service plans that have uh, alpha track monitors. So we can see if their radon levels are rising. But I haven't really, I haven't really had to deal with that yet. So good question. Yeah. Okay. And, and with that, I, I am going to transition to the next section. And so let me get back to the presentation. So I'll go quickly since you know we are spending most of the time here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the product. So here's a, a kind of a snapshot of the four products that we offer the Radon I, the Radon I Pro, which is an NRPP, NRSP certified product, EcoCube and EcoTracker. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail later uh, on some of the features here. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest point here that I wanted to make is the, we have one of the highest sensitivity radon monitors out there. Um, and that's this number that comes up uh, in the specification, which is 30 CPH per PCI per liter. Uh, so what that, what that is, is it's 30 counts per hour. So think of it as, you know, this monitor is, is sampling that air, right? Uh, that radon infused air uh, 30 times per hour. And you will notice that I'll, I'll show you show a table later. Uh, that number, if you compare it to our competition, it's, you know, sometimes 10 times as high. So that gives the fast response and the accuracy that we're you know, touting you know, over our competition. Uh, and this graph, I was gonna share this graph. Uh, these are two independent studies run by University of Michigan and also uh, KSU, Kansas State. Uh, and what they did uh, was they benchmark our consumer model against the reference model. And in this case, in University of Michigan, it was an alpha guard. Uh, and in the case of Kansas State, it was a pylon AP5. And these are instruments that cost, you know, $10,000. And typically, you know, any mitigators or home inspection professionals will buy these. Uh, these, these are for, you know, uh, university research. Uh, but the point here is that if you, if you look at the graph, uh, this graphs how the instrument is responding to the changing uh, radon levels over time. And as you can see, our $176 rate on I is tracking, you know, almost exactly uh, the same curves that these reference models are, are tracking to. And this is all because of this 30 CPH that I talked about, it's the sensitivity. Now, if I go to this uh, next slide, uh, again, you know, we, <clears throat> this is our claim to fame 30 CPH. And just a glance at it, you know, these are public specifications. So, you know, you could check that on your own, but, you know, these are specs uh, offered by our other uh, competition. Uh, so we think we offer one of the fastest, uh, most accurate and reliable radar monitors out there. Now, this is the four devices I spoke about um, in, in a table. 
couple are more consumer. Yeah, some professionals use the radon eye and EcoQ for, for you know, post-mitigation job, things like that, uh, diagnostics. Uh, but we do have the NRSP, NRPP certified radon eye pro, uh, and also this EcoTracker, which is a, you know, four pack monitor hotspot finder. Uh, and, you know, various connectivity technologies, some are Bluetooth, some are both, uh, and all support the mobile app, uh, as well as uh, in the case of Radon Eye uh, dashboard, you know, PC dashboard, okay? And EcoTracker, the, the advantage here is that, again, it comes on four with four devices, and you could rapidly, you know, go into a house or a building and figure out, you know, where the hotspots are. Uh, so you have four devices, so you could deploy them in, in a single room in different corners, perhaps, or you could go into different rooms uh, in deployment there, uh, or different levels, you know, if, if the job uh, calls for multi-level, uh, you know, quick diagnostics. Now, this offers a very quick reading capability, uh, five minutes uh, being one mode. It also has a 10-minute mode, and it also has the bonus of the continuous radar monitoring mode where you, know, you could keep it running for as long as you want. Uh, now these offer the 30 CPH, the sensitivity, and has a, a wider range than our consumer models uh, going, measuring up to 255 PCI, okay? And of course, all of these are supported with our app. And I know there was one question about uh, what's the difference between radon eye and the, the eco tracker? Well, again, the eco tracker, uh, one, one of the uh, great feature of this is this Bluetooth broadcast. We call it BLE broadcast. So it constantly reads all four monitors uh, without having to, you know, individually uh, click on the device, you know, sync up the device and make the reading. So it offers a tremendous convenience when you're doing uh, diagnostics. And you could do it, you know, more efficient than say, you know, single uh, radar eye placed in four different places because you're gonna have to go there and keep on switching. Uh, for one thing, uh, it also offers the five-minute mode versus uh, typically the radar eye can give you reading in the uh, first ten minutes, uh, so it does give you that advantage. And again, in the wider range in terms of the PCI, it goes up to two fifty-five versus a ninety-nine on the radar eye. Okay. And you get a nice carry bag on top of all that. <laughs> so uh, again, it's a four pack. So it comes with a carrying, carrying case, the adapters, a step up cable for optional battery. You know, we do, uh, we, it can run on the batteries. Uh, so uh, we don't sell them, but you know, they're available widely uh, through Amazon. And of course uh, these need to be plugged in. So we offer the uh, extension cables. And that is it. Yeah, it was a short, 30 minute, um, but we wanted to keep it short and, and make, you know, keep it compact. And we'll be running, you know, more series, uh, webinar series, um, you know, as, as the time goes on. Uh, so at this point, I will open up for Q and A. And let me go back to the Q and A and there's some, chat sessions also. Yeah, so I can start hammering some of these questions if you want. Yeah, why don't you take right. those that are. So Nate asked, do you ever use the eco tracker after completing the radon mitigation to see if there's radon reduction for, if, to see if there is a radon reduction for a difficult job? So yeah, we set them up in the morning. Um, now with John, we can get jobs done faster versus just me. So even when we are on a job for one day, we've got those four monitors set up. Usually we get the fan on and then we've got a couple hours of like punch list stuff clean up. Um, so we can see that that radon start to tail off towards the end of the day. A lot of times they're below one. Um, I usually do not leave them there. So I have to come back and pick them up. However, my cousin Mike's house, um, I left them there for two weeks. We had some 20 degree below days. Um, 20, uh, 20 degrees below zero days. And so this kind of would go into um, Leo's question. How do you guarantee that the radon levels stay low? 
Um, so typically we get the highest stack effect in the winter as probably a lot of you already know. And it kept Mike's radon levels below one, um, just treating that well room, which again, did give us pressure field extension into the basement. It was the two upper slab on grade portions that we were not hitting. So obviously the only way to know if you're keeping the radon low throughout the whole year is to monitor, to continue to monitor. But, and then we've got Leo, what factor difference do you see with the four detectors when you start hot spotting? Um, so as on a bid today, they, they wanted to know like, hey, are you gonna test the radon when you come here? You know, they had a Corenium home and they had an air check sent off to the lab. So I said, no, I'm not going to, but I explained I had these eco trackers and I bring them in sometimes. So I had those with me and I go, you can scatter these around while I look around. And they started out around the twos in the basement. And then he had like a, uh, where the front step was, there was a bay window that jogged out and they did not pour concrete under that. So it was just open to the dirt. So you could like get up in the rim joist and look down and see dirt where you would normally expect concrete. You go, hey, throw one up there too. So that one is a, was at like six and a half on our first reading. So after five minutes, and then they do keep updating and that does change. Um, it's not an average, at least right now, now, or right now it's not. But so they all started around two and then they kind of leveled off around three, three and a half amongst the three and that one up uh, in that rim joist area stayed around six and a half. So there's a little bit of ramp up time, but it didn't take too long. And then factor difference when you start hot spotting. Um, I think that's kind of what you're talking about, Leo. I'm not a huge measurement nerd. Um, so correct me if that's not what you're asking, but I've tried these just right back. Got my bed back there. So I tried them right back there and I've left them for, you know, a, a week or so. And they're, I constantly look at them and they're all usually pretty close to each other. You might get a one and a zero on the other, but if you look at the average, um, they're, they're like remarkably spot on, at least mine are. You know, I might get a 0 0.5 on one or, and then a 0 0.5 four, six on the other. So they're very, very close when they're next to each other. Have I seen two 200 Pico carries with them? Oh, no, not yet. No, <laughs> hopefully not. I have not, I have not seen 200 Pico carries. I did have a customer that was, um, his radon levels tested at like 10. And he's like, ah, I tested like, you know, 10 years ago to test it at 10. Um, and then I did a test recently, it was four. And he's like, I don't really know, do I have a problem? And I go, well, I got these eco trackers, let's throw these in. So my eco trackers are showing around 10. And I go, hey, just for the heck of it, I'm a nerd. I want to see what happens when I lift up the sump cover and stick an eco tracker right on, you know, under the sump cover. Um, so was, the cover was just propped up on it on the concrete floor. And it quickly shot up to like, I don't know, 20 or 30 or 40 Pico carries. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's enough. So I pulled it out right away. All right, then on the Q&A side, there's a few, let's see. Okay, yeah, so I, I do have our product manager, Jamie, responding to uh, product specific questions. Let's see, there's one from Nate. How do you account for the radioactive secular equilibrium ramp up for a 10 minute reading for the ecosystem detector? Okay. So Nate, that's a little too technical for me. <laughs> Sorry. Me too. <laughs> uh, Ask Leo. Uh, our, let's see. So from Jim, so there, so these machines don't have to be left on site for very long. Okay. You will know that your level and the time it takes to do a home inspection. Yeah, that's. That's that's a yes. I mean, we're talking about, you know, in ten minutes you could get a uh, reading with a eco tracker. Yeah, you can get a reading in five minutes, but that's not 
this is not like an official radon test it's not a like right right it's it's not a yeah. certified device so it's just a, um, another tool it, to it's, add it's to your tool toolbox to, you know get an understanding of the you know relative levels right yeah so so one question or one thing that might answer some of the questions here mm -hmm. is so mike's house i use that example because it's fresh in my memory just did it mm -hmm. so when i scattered his radon monitors i think i went back after like an hour we filmed some other stuff and then like hey let's check and see what these monitors are reading and that wall room was like a six and a half i think after the first hour uh, it averaged six and a half. And then the basement was like a 2.7. And I think the upper slabs, like the kitchen and the entry were like just right around two, maybe slightly under. And then I left them run for like six hours and the well room had risen and kind of leveled off to 15 pico carries. And then the, the basement kind of averaged around 3.7 and the upper two slabs still stayed right around two. So that 15 had a little bit more of that ramp up time. It could have been we had the door open in that little well room and then closed it. So maybe that's part of why we saw it climb. But it still it still pointed me in that direction, which was the key. I don't care really if it's 15 pico carries or 10 pico carries. It was still a, you know, telling me, hey, this is something that's probably going to need to be addressed. It didn't change my approach for it. Okay, a couple of questions about calibration. Yeah, these are consumer cons uh, considered consumer grade, so they cannot be calibrated. Useful service life for the tracker and a lot of our other consumer model products are five years. So a lot of, lot of our customers are actually, you know, kind of doing their own, you know, self, uh, not, not, not calibration, but measurement to make sure that the device is not way offline, which is, you know, you use a, a real a charcoal kit, a very inexpensive charcoal kit, and, you know, do a benchmark against that, you know, on an annual basis. Uh, but these are, these cannot be calibrated. Yeah, or you can use them next to your CRMs and see if it's out of line. Yeah, if you have a, like our Pro, which is a calibrate, calibratable uh, device, you can benchmark against that, yeah, side by side to see that it's uh, it's in calibration. Okay, and, and with that, yeah, I'm kind of out of time. So, um, you know, thank thank you very much, uh, and you know, I encourage you you to get in touch with us uh, if you have you know further questions or you know concerns or whatnot.